Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you for letting us be here and letting us present. So I am Carlos Nuno. I do work at the at ACES ABA. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the field for 18 years now, going on 19 in 2023. So I've been doing this for quite some time and I've had experiences working with all ages, uh, but I've been at ACES ABA for about three, going on four years. Um, so yeah, so we'll just get started. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, my um, my uh, colleague, uh, Vanessa, is here too. So if you guys want to throw any questions in the chat, feel free to throw any questions in the chat and she can help uh, answer those or I can answer them on here. And then also, um, if we have some time at the end of the, of, uh, the presentation, then we can answer some of those questions then, okay? So let me share my screen with everyone. And can everybody see my screen? Just give me a nod. Awesome, thank you. Yes. All right. So we will be talking about um, how to be independent with toileting. Okay, so we'll start with this and then um, we'll go through this a little bit and then we'll talk a little bit about aggression and maladaptive behaviors. Um, let me mind myself how to uh, work a PowerPoint. Uh, so first, you know, just I uh, introduce myself. We'll talk about some prerequisite skills, reinforcers, task analysis, and visuals, and then we'll have a Q and A. Um, with this, uh, hold on, just, yeah, um, just, you know, with, especially with toilet training, be patient with yourself and your child. Don't force it. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, toileting is something that's something that's definitely difficult to with with all of our kids, whether they're uh, typical or um, have an uh, ASD diagnosis. So how to you know if your child is ready? Um, just kind of some questions to ask yourself. Uh, can your child stay dry for a period of two hours? Uh, do they wake up dry from their night's sleep? Um, and can they uh, identify and communicate when they have a wet diaper or you know even wet underwear if you've already tried to, uh, to kind of start that? Um, other things too, can they pull up their pants, pull them up and down, you know, uh, kind of get dressed and undressed. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the bowel movements, but we'll focus more on uh, urination today, okay? Uh, so let me move on to the next slide. So <laughs> types of toiletrying. So potty party, has anybody ever heard of that? If you have, you know that a potty party is really not a party, right? Uh, it's, um, it's, it's something that's a little, um, it takes some time to, to work on, but we will definitely touch on that for a little bit. And then the one that we find that tends to be more common is scheduled toileting. Um, there are other methods. Um, these aren't the only two, but these are the two that we will focus on today. Okay. All right, so first, before we start anything, right, when we start uh, collecting data on any type of behavior, um, uh, toileting being one of those, we want to collect baseline data. So we kind of use a sheet that has, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily this one. You can even write it just on your a notepad or something, but kind of keeping track of, uh, of the potty, right? Whether it's uh, if your child had, you know, a urine accident or a bowel movement accident, um, you, you can start tracking those things, right? Um, and the reason we want to yeah, baseline data is going to really help us when we start identifying what kind of approach we want to take towards potty training. Say that it's the, and I'll touch based on this uh, again in uh, when we talk about the scheduling toileting. But you know, it's going to give you an idea of what intervals you want to do for potty, right? Um, and then for the other one, if you know, like say they can go, you know, an hour um, without an accident, then. You know, it just gives you an idea of where your, your child is at. And again, then that helps you identify, do you want to start with urinations? Do you want to start with bowel movements? Do you want to do both? Again, urination is probably going to be a little easier, especially when we're talking about the potty party. Um, so we'll get into that. So what is a potty party, right? So it's two to three uh, day time frame. It could be less depending on how your child does. And you want to use up to eight hours per day. Um, Again, there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm just gonna kind of cover the general part of it um, and how to approach it. I'm not, I don't, we're not gonna really touch on, on uh, uh, some things, right? But then um, you can always get some uh, resources and stuff to give you more information. But um, materials that we need, 
and then I'll explain why we need these materials. So a uh, stool for your child to place their feet on. Uh, preferred activities uh, during this time, it is okay to use uh, an iPad. Um, salty food, as long as it's okay for your child to have salty foods or if, as long as it's okay with your doctor, right? Um, liquids, obviously we're having a potty party and we want them to pee as much as possible. So that's why we try to introduce the salty foods and the, uh, and the liquids, right? And you can't go pee if you're not drinking, right? And then the reason we want them to, uh, we want them to drink a little bit more, we add those salty foods. And then you want to have a bathroom with lots of space or just somewhere where you and your child can be comfortable. A timer and the obvious, right, a cleaning materials. Uh, so paper towels, sanitizing spray, et cetera, toilet paper. Don't forget that. We have plenty now, a days. <laughs> um, and then also, I didn't add this on here, but even having like a, a towel um, that you don't mind getting, like, it, you don't mind for it to get soiled. Right now, again, I'll explain why we will need that. If you have any questions, feel free to add some in the chat. So how would we put this all together? Um, so with the potty party, like I said, it's going to be a two to three day process. And it's going to take about, you know, eight hours a day. Um, and the reason I was saying that it's not really a party, you know, you want to be in the restroom with your child for this time frame, right? There are breaks that you can give them in, in between to kind of get out of the bathroom because I'm sure that nobody wants to be in the bathroom for that long of a period. But, um, but there's a reason for this, right? So what we would start with is you wanna have some um, activities, some neutral activities for your child to engage in because we're gonna have them sitting on the toilet for, for quite some time, right? So we're gonna start off with, and again, this is just like an example. Everybody's child is gonna be different. You know, and again, that's why we go back to the baseline data, right? Like how often are they going? Also like during that period, you can identify how long can my child sit? And then we can build on that, right? Because I can't sit on the toilet for too long. I don't know if any of you guys can, but you know, after a while, it, it's not fun. So um, we would start about, so again, this is an example. We would start with about 15 minutes on the toilet. And then during that time, they're engaging in neutral activities. Um, and then we have three minutes off. And we'll talk about um, how to progress through this. Uh, okay. So, you know, when we're on the toilet, um, again, the reason we want to have the neutral activities is we don't want them to get too excited, right? So we say we have a child that, you know, say they get too excited when they're watching Peppa Pig, right? And then they do hand flapping or they want to jump up and down. We don't want them to engage in those high, um, uh, you know, like those, uh, well, those behaviors, right? Just kind of getting out of seat because the purpose is for them to sit on the toilet. Um, you know, and then, you know, throughout your you're engaging in these activities, praising them for being on the toilet. And what you really wanna see is like during this time, you're giving them those snacks, you're giving them those salty foods, you're giving them the liquids so that they pee, right? So while they're sitting on the toilet, um, just kind of give them a go, like give them about 10 to 15 minutes with all these liquids, they should be urinating at some point. Um, and um, yeah, and you know, you just wanna reinforce that. So during this time, they're going to be one thing that I didn't mention earlier. You want to make sure that they're uh, not closed at that point. I mean, they, well, at least from the waist down, you know, because um, they are going to be on the toilet for some time. Um, if they do have a success, you want to make like a big deal about it, right? Just that's where we have the party. That's when we're having fun. We're praising them like, hey, good job. Great job going potty in the toilet. I don't know if any uh, if anyone ever watched Luke Who's Talking. Uh, I might have just aged myself, but uh, they have the pee-pee in the potty dance. I mean, just throw it all out there. Just, you know, make sure that, you, that you're making it a big deal about it. Um, and so during that time, actually, like, if say that they, you know, have a urine success within, you know, before the 15 minutes are up, you can take them off the toilet at that point. That way, you know, you're reinforcing with foods, you're reinforcing with toys, just with everything, just to let them know, like, what you just did, this is what we want, and you're doing an amazing job. Um, when you're off the toilet, uh, so say that you go the 15 minutes, they don't go in, you know, in the toilet, um, you can put a, uh, you can put underwear back on them, and again, that's just going to kind of help you with some of the mess a little bit, and that's why I also mentioned to have a towel somewhere nearby. Um, so say that in that 10, 15 minute stretch, they don't go to the restroom. You take them off for 
a couple of minutes. Uh, the previous slides, let's say, we'll say three minutes, right? You take them off for three minutes. During that time, they can engage in still neutral activities. Uh, they're in their underwear and they're sitting on that towel. If your child starts to have an accident, then you want to provide quick feedback. Say, and we can just keep this very neutral. Like we don't have to, you know, uh, get too animated. Just say, no, we pee in the potty or we pee in the toilet, however you want to address it. And then guide them to the restroom. Now, once you got into the, I mean, sorry, to the toilet. So this whole time you're not leaving that restroom, right? So that's why we're not leaving because you can get them to the toilet a lot quicker. Um, have them finish in the toilet. And if they didn't finish uh, or if they already finished and they don't have anything else, I mean, just you can just have them sit there a little bit longer just in case there's a little bit extra and then you kind of restart your time. Okay. Um, let's see. Any questions so far? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so when do we move on, right? So when do we move on from the from from one schedule to the next? So once your child has two to three successes in the toilet and remain dry off the toilet, um, and that's when you can uh, fix your on and off period. Because we're slowly trying to shape that behavior where, okay, now you've gone this long, like so now we're going to reduce the time that you're on the toilet because you're showing me that you can go in the toilet and we're gonna increase the time that you're off the toilet because now you're showing me that you can kind of, you have some control over that, right? Um, and then once your child can be, and again, the 10 minutes, it's, it's give and take, it's very different for everybody. Um, once you hit the, the 10 minute mark, then you can just have them leave that area, right? So they're off the, the bathroom for 10 minutes. Uh, at that point, um, you can, you know, introduce, uh, um, the scheduled toilet training, which we're going to talk about next. Again, this is all just like, um, these are just examples. Again, just it all depends on how your child learns, how your child's doing with this. And that's why we say it's a two to three day uh, trial, I guess, or um, we, we work on it for two to three days because, you know, uh, day one, they may get to, you know, 10 minutes on the toilet and like five minutes off, right? But so the next, so after that, at that point, say that the day one ends, you kind of just go back into your routine. At that point, you decide if you want to put them in your in underwear, or if you want to put them back in uh, their diaper. Um, I think we're going to touch on this a little bit later again, but that will be your call. So the only thing, and this is just more from experience, right? So we've done potty parties in the past, and we've had clients that you know they they might have a few successes through the day. We're continuing to go. They learn that at the end of the day that they get to get their diaper back on, so, or their pull up. So what do they do? They just hold it for that long period of time, right? So that's the only thing that we might run into. So it's really up to you how you want to approach it. If you want to put them back in the diaper, pull up, cool. If you don't, I would just recommend having, um, you know, like those sheets on your, the, the protectors on your mattresses so that you're not um, getting them too soiled. <laughs> uh, and yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? Like I said, this is kind of brief, um, but there, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to ask. Okay. And then we go into scheduled uh, toilet training, right? So again, to to uh, the scheduled toilet training, this does not need to be associated with the potty party. That's just so it gives you an idea for like once you're done with the potty party, like where you're going to start going. Um, depending on how your child does, again, when we're looking at the baseline, like, then that can tell us like what we're going to do. So say that you decide like, hey, the potty party might be too much of a commitment or it might be too difficult for my client, uh, my child to stay in the restroom, then let's go ahead and do the scheduled toilet training. Um, when you take baseline, you really wanna document um, all the information you can. So then say that at the end of the day, you notice that your child is going to, or had going, you know, having a pee accident on an average of 37 minutes, right? Um, so at that point, you're not going to wait those 37 minutes or you don't want to go past those 37 minutes. I would actually recommend putting them on a schedule of 30 minutes. Why? Because if they haven't had the, the accident at those 30 minutes, when you're looking at the average, you have more of a chance for them to be successful. And at that point, um, you're getting close to that average where they are going to go. So it's going to be a better chance for them to have uh, urine um, success. Okay. 
And then when you guys do have them sit on the toilet, uh, you can do it from five to 15 minutes or from whenever they, they actually board in the toilet. Okay. Any questions? Um, so we want to have reinforcement. And again, that's for both the, uh, the potty party and for schedule and any real like um, toilet training, right? We really want to make sure that our ch children are very motivated to go pee. Uh, I mean, if you're going to give me a dollar for every time I go to the bathroom, like I'm going to go through my gallon of water pretty quickly, right? Like just, hey, I'm, I'm breaking in the dough. So you want to really make sure that you're making it worth it for your child. Um, uh, and then even then, in, in during these times, like say that your child has a hard time with transitioning to the bathroom using first end. So uh, first key in the potty, and then you can have this. So just kind of different uh, approaches that you can take to really get them to start transitioning into the restroom. Um, and also to having successes in the restroom, right? And again, just like the potty party, once they go and have a success, you really wanna make a big deal about it. Um, just, it's the biggest thing you know, that you can do. Um, and then even with reinforcement, what you can do, uh, again, and for the potty party too, if you want to start um, limiting certain activities or reinforcers or things that they really like. So say that, you know, your child really, really likes ice cream, right? So then you're not going to give them ice cream any other time of the day. I know summers here get hot. If they want ice cream, nope, you can't have any, but if you're going to practice toileting, you know, whenever they have a success, that's the only time that they get access to that ice cream, right? Because now it's more meaningful. Now it's like, oh, I really, really want that ice cream because it's so hot that, you know, I'm going to go in the bathroom, right? So again, just ways to teach our children to understand like why they're getting that reinforcer and what they need to do to get that reinforcer. Yeah. If your child does have an accident with, uh, when you're doing the toilet training, uh, same as with the potty party, you take them um, straight into the restroom. If they, I mean, more than likely, since they're not gonna be close to the toilet, they're probably already gonna be, be done at that point. Um, but you still wanna take them to the bathroom, have them sit down on the toilet and have them finish or just sit there and just say, no, we uh, pee in the toilet or we pee in the potty, okay? Um, and then at this point too, you know, make sure that, um, that they also help you with like the dressing and undressing part. So they're done peeing, like at that point, you know, like just have them help you. It, even if you need help, like if they need help, you can hand over hand, whatever you want to do to help them, uh, just kind of start that process, okay? Okay, um, and also if you notice that your child is continuing to have accidents within those 30 minute intervals, then it's okay to reduce that number, right? Because again, we want them to be successful. We want them to have access to that reinforcement. So if we need to make adjustments, let's make adjustments. So aside from collecting baseline data, you want to continue to collect data uh, during this process. You can also do what we call spot checks. So within the interval, so say that you're going every 30 minutes, you know, maybe every 10, 15 minutes, you're gonna check your child. And you're like, okay, let's, let's do a spot check and see if they're dry or if they're wet. If they're dry, again, make a big deal about it. You know, at this point you could start introducing like a token economy, right? So they get a token for being dry um, or something else. Maybe it's a quick tangible, uh, you know, you can even, you know, create like a specific reinforcer that they don't have access to unless they're dry, and you could give them at that point. Say that it's one M&M, &M, you know, I wouldn't give them a whole bag, you just, you know, maybe just uh, break it down, give them one M&M &M for every time that they're dry. If they are wet, and then we'll just go back and follow the procedure for, uh, for accidents, okay? All right, and then we're gonna have a lot of tips and tricks, so. Uh, you can write some of these down. So one of the biggest things is like anything uh, bathroom related, make sure that you're doing in the bathroom. I know this is going to be hard um, just because you're, because sometimes it's easier, especially if you have a child that's, you know, in diapers or pull-ups, it's probably easier to just like, you know what, we're in the living room, the bag's right here, let's just do this. We just want them to start associating that anything bathroom related, go, you, you do in the bathroom, right? So uh, you will need to change them on the floor if you want to have a changing table in your bathroom, like, you want to start doing all that stuff in that. Again, you're just building that association. And then the other one, if your child hides to go to the bathroom, especially I know this happens more with like bowel movements and stuff, 
um, start teaching them a new hiding spot, which is the bathroom, right? So you say that you catch them, like you're like, oh, okay, oh, you know, little Carlos went into to the corner, there he goes. Just go get little Carlos, bring them over, you know, and you don't even, you don't, I mean, you can just grab their hand and be neutral and be like, oh, let's go to the bathroom. Uh, it looks like, or it looks like you need to go to the bathroom. Let's go to the bathroom and guide them to the bathroom. Um, again, because this is their new hiding spot, right? That's where we all had to go to the bathroom, right? And I don't, you know, we're not going to go to the corner. <laughs> Big Carlos is not going to go to the corner. <laughs> um, so, you know, we just want to make sure that we're, again, just associating. And I keep saying that because, um, that's the, I think that's one of the areas where it's easy to forget because some things are just easier to do in the moment. It's easier to change our children in the living room or, you know, in our bedroom, but let's start doing all that. Okay. Um, and then have them help with other steps. As I mentioned earlier, you want them to help with undressing and dressing, make those things fun. Um, so it's not like, oh, I only have to undress or dress when I have a potty accident. No, just do it all the time. Like whenever, you know, you're getting ready for bed, you're going to put PJs on. Um, or maybe you can make it into a game. You can make it something fun so that it's also not something that becomes very aversive. Because then when you are having those accidents, um, they're going to struggle, right? It's going to be, it's going to be a fight to get them in the toilet and it's going to be a fight to get them to change. And again, provide tons of praise for being dry for using a new hiding spot and helping with steps. You know, you know just make this fun. Well, as, as fun as can be, right? Uh, other uh, tips and tricks, um, using visuals. So if your kid does well with visuals, you know, have like, um, you know, a little chart, maybe on the chart on the left, um, you know, that's where you put the stickers for each step that they complete on their own. Uh, so I know that there's kind of like small and little, Brainy, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, and then you can also, you know, and that way you can, uh, but you can use show these visuals just to um, show them what steps to take. You know, these are, again, just generic. You can always make your own. Everybody's process is a little different. Um, so you can um, create those uh, to whatever way works best for you. And honestly, if you just Google like bathroom schedules, you can find something and just print it out. Um, like I was uh, talking about earlier, I know some kids struggle just with transitions in general. So even using the first step, you know, having them pick what they want to work for. So um, say that with those treats and reinforcers that you're withholding, maybe you have an, like an array of them. Maybe you have three different things that they can pick from so that they don't get um, satiated on one specific thing. Say so like, oh, so today, what do you want to work for? We have M&Ms, we have gummy worms, and you know, we have iPad time, you know, so they pick as soon as they pick. All right. First potty, uh, then gummy worms. I just use gummy worms because those are my favorite. So um, you can use that to have them transition. And once they transition, um, so, so, you know, you can even tell them the steps like, oh, look, first we're going to the, you know, to the bathroom and they go. As soon as they're done, you have them wash your hands because you don't want to give them the gummy worms without their hands being washed. And then you're like, Oh, now, you know, now you get your worm, uh, gummy worms. And you can even show them the visual again if you have one. Um, like, oh, look, first you went potty. Now you're getting your guns. And then if your um, child has a daily schedule, you could include it into that daily schedule. Um, so, you know, say that you have a bedtime routine, you can put that into the bedtime routine, wherever you think is the best time to... Uh, to do it, maybe having them go potty right before they get dressed into their new pose, right? Um, but you can do this in the morning for their morning routines. You can do this for their night routines or just overall, just like, hey, you know, we're all, we're going to go to the bathroom at this time. Um, the other thing is use correct terms for body parts. Again, so using um, stomach instead of Tummy, again, this is everybody's, you know, this is to your preference. If you want to use tummy um, or whatever you want to use, um, go for it. Uh, this is just more just, I think, you know, at some point our children are going to become like teens and adults. Um, so, you know, just in case they, you know, like the doctor asks them, oh, where does it hurt? You know, they say my tummy. I mean, everybody knows tummy, right? So that probably won't get misconstrued, but just in case, you know, you want to make sure that they can identify those body parts. 
<clears throat> and also if your child is not showing um, signs that they are ready for potty training, then that's when you decide when you want to, right? Um, so say that they're five or six and they're still not showing those signs, it's okay for you to start um, that process with them, okay? So you decide like, you know, as of this day, we're gonna save a bunch of money on, on diapers. We're not gonna buy diapers anymore, right? And then, um, and I'm learning that just now, recently. So they are expensive. <laughs> um, so, you know, you wanna make sure that, um, that you decide and once you decide, uh, making sure that you're consistent with it and everybody that's around and anybody that's gonna interact with your child, that they're consistent with it too, okay? And the last thing is patience. As difficult as it is for us as parents to teach the skill, it's also difficult for our kids because they're learning a new skill. So that's why we wanna add reinforcement. We wanna make this fun um, or as fun as can be, um, but it's, you know, we want them to be successful at this and we don't want this to be something that, that becomes aversive, right? Um, so reinforce your ideas, so praise, cheers, do a dance. Um, give them special stickers or you have like that token economy like we we're talking about earlier. Um, if once they get, they progress a little bit more uh, and you are giving them, you know, like I don't want you buying the toy for them for every time that they go to the bathroom or for every day because that's just gonna get too expensive. But if you, you know, say for the kids are in the more advanced stages of potty training, if you say, hey, you know, if you go three days without an accident, then we'll buy you a new toy. Or we'll go to Target or whatever it is, um, or we'll go to the zoo. If you go a whole month without an accident, then you know we'll go to the zoo. However you want to phrase that, but like in even having charge for them so they can see that that you know you're gonna give them that. And once you say like, hey, if you do this and I'm gonna give you this, make sure that you're always consistent. Because then after a while, I'd like to say, hey, you know, mom said that mom or dad said that if I don't pee, have an accident for a month, I'm gonna go to the zoo. Then say that you know, our kids were, you know, able to identify that, like, hey, I haven't peed, and then they're like, oh, we're not going to go. Guess what? There's a chance that they're going to regress a little bit. Okay, um, but there are many methods out there. Just find one that works for your child. Um, so we did that, uh, the three-day method. So th this is the one with the potty training, um, and then just being fully committed as you can, right? Again, uh, if you try one method and it doesn't work, that's okay. Then just try the next method, but try to give it a chance. You know, say it's not working after a couple of hours, don't give up on it. If you're doing scheduled training, if it's not working after like three or four days, don't give up on it. Just, you know, just adjust with your child. Okay. Any questions? I'll ask some questions just because I know I've heard other parents ask questions about these things. So yes, just course. in case people are shy. Yes. Question one, how do you address when the children have a sensory issue with, say, flushing the toilet that's just too loud for them? So because of that, now they've developed some sort of fear of actually going on a toilet. Yeah. And that way, like, um, and, and Vanessa, feel free to chime in on this too, but <laughs> uh, for, uh, you know, we can work on desensitization. So say that that is an issue and they struggle with like the, the sounds, the flush in the toilet. Um, like I wouldn't start going, I know that some of my clients struggle with going to the restroom in public because those tend to be a lot louder. So we're not gonna do that yet, right? <laughs> we're just gonna make sure that before you leave the house, we're gonna use the restroom, right? We're gonna use it at home. But as far as, you know, it's just like the sound of using the restroom even at home, it's just working on that desensitization. Um, you know, slowly introduce it. Maybe they have to wear, um, you know, uh, noise canceling uh, headgear, that um, earphones, that's totally fine. Um, just to kind of get them used to that and letting them know that that's not, um, you know, it's not as scary. Okay. And I also want to add that um, this might be a multidisciplinary um, decision to make. You might have to work with a team of individuals. If you have like an OT that you're working with or, other providers, even physical therapists, if there's motor difficulties, um, these are providers that we can also work with and can help accommodate for um, the, the needs of that individual. So like, for example, if there are some high sensory needs, we can work with the OT to make adjustments in how we present it. Maybe it's um, adjusting the lighting to make sure that this space feels safe for them. 
Um, or if we do have to modify, I have, I have done this protocol, but not in the bathroom, but in another identified safe place for that child using like a potty, potty seat and then working to eventually move to the bathroom. This is a longer process, but if that's what's necessary, that can definitely be done. Yeah, that is actually going to be my next question. Then what happens if you have a child then, you know, is afraid of you know, sitting on the toilet because it's really big compared to them. You know, I'm like, I'm going to fall through or, you know, whatever it is. And then I guess that would have been my question is that, is it, so I'm, I guess if they're capable, obviously that would be the best thing, right? To use the, the traditional toilet. Yes. But if that isn't an option, is it okay to do like the, you know, the little kid toilets where, you know, you the parent has to dump and, and all of that? Or is that more confusing? Have you found that that to be more confusing for the kids? So I think my recommendation now, especially like, I mean, if that's the way that your child's going to learn, obviously that's uh, cool. Go for it. You know, that, that will help. Mm -hmm. um, the hard part, that, the struggle that might come down the, the road is, um, is then transitioning from that little toilet to the big toilet. So um, now I know that they sell all these cool, like adaptable seats, you know, mm -hmm. that has the, the smaller seat already embedded into the bigger seat. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little more pricey, but at the same time, it's, um, it's going to make that transition so much easier. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I remember when I, my, my child's a little bit older now, but I remember this was a struggle too. We weren't potty trained until a little after, about four. So we, you know, it took us a little bit longer, but um, we also bought those books and then it had like the flushing sound to kind of mm -hmm. ease it into it. And, you know, I think it kind of helped. I don't know, but I mean, that's another thing that we, I remember we used. Yeah. And, um, no, that's perfect. Because yeah, they, they have a bunch of books, they have songs, you know, that you can start singing. That's why it's the, the pee pee in the potty song from that <laughs> movie. Um, but also, uh, you know, social stories, you know, having some of those social stories. And um, so there are definitely a lot of different techniques. It just mm -hmm. depends on like, how your child learns best, you know. Um, so I have, you know, I know some kids that, you know, thrive with social stories. Um, mm -hmm. So you can use those. And, Okay. And my other last, no, well, I'm sure I have a ton, but my other question would be, I know, obviously, again, probably the same answer with the OT is that, what do you do when, okay, say we're, we're successful with number one, you know, we're yeah. number one isn't a problem. It's number two. That's the problem. Either it's again, the sensory, either maybe I don't like the smell it makes and therefore I don't want to be in here or yeah. then, you know, and then, okay, so now we're over the smell, but how, you know, what do we, how do we address the ones that have issues with the wiping because it's kind of gross and, you know, they have that sensory issue um, of, of, you know, I don't want to get my hands dirty or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you can even add like, okay, we're, wear a glove, you know, have those, you know, some little latex gloves or uh, it just, uh, I mean, I don't know if, you know, some of the kids would, would like that, but even um, uh, just again, you could go back to that desensitization, just working on different textures that are like that, like working with peanut butter, working with um, pudding, and uh, hopefully that doesn't deter anybody from eating those later on tonight. Uh, but just, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, maybe working with them and having some of those textures so they can get used to those textures and really reinforcing when they're okay with, uh, with those textures. If it's a smell, then that's a little harder. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right. I mean, Gas with some essential oil in there or something. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then, um, and then just another thing to add, right, if you have kids too that, you know, have uh, issues with bowel movement and stuff, like, you know, with everything else, right, we just want to make sure that uh, we go see a doctor too. That's one thing that I add in the slide, but, you know, there are, you know, we have kids that have stomach issues um, and you can't, you know, like I, don't want to force a child to try to have a bowel movement when they do have those stomach issues. So if you think it's something medical, always make sure that you, you're going to your pediatrician or your doctor. Okay. And I know another one, this is another one I see a lot of um, <coughs> other parents have issues with that. So um, I guess this is kind of like, okay, well, we're not potty trained, but we're having issues with either um, getting, you know, our hands in our diapers and then smearing it everywhere or, you know, I don't, I mean, you know, in the middle of the night, same thing. They, I mean, obviously at that point, we know that they, I believe, I think that they're not ready to be potty trained, but they're still going at night. So obviously, yeah. but how would you deal with that? I mean, that one's a hard one because it's, it's 
concerning health wise. And, you know, obviously it's, I mean, other than it being not a behavior that you want, it's just, it could be dangerous. So how would you try to address that one? Vanessa, can you help with this one? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, we're actually going to go into talking about behaviors in the next slide, but a lot of the content will apply to that as well. But it would be possibly looking at replacement behaviors that would be that we can teach in order to um, have them pick a more appropriate okay. uh, behavior to engage in. And then sometimes, you know, it depends also on the age and the appropriateness, but being creative about clothing choices, things like that, um, you know, so maybe using like uh, wearing a belt with their pants or things like that. So it makes it a little bit harder to get access to the area. I've had parents that use um, like footsie pajamas because they're hard to get into, but again, depends on the age and things like that. Um, but I, you know, going back to really like the fundamentals of ABA is finding those replacement behaviors, teaching that skill that we want them to engage in instead, and then we'll reduce that undesired behavior. I guess that's a good segue to the next one then. <laughs> yeah, so let me pull that one up. So just give me a second. All right, can everyone see my screen again? Awesome, thank you. So picking your battles, so how to address aggression. Um, so, you know, today we're gonna review, uh, you know, defining behaviors, functions of behaviors, and then we'll talk about replacement behaviors and then other strategies. And then again, like with the potty training, we can have a little Q and A at the end. Um, and so we'll get started. So first, what is a behavior, right? We always talk about behaviors. So when we're looking at behaviors, especially when we're, we're looking at it in ABA, right? We're looking at things that are observable and measurable. So anything that we can see, anything that we can hear, anything that we can feel, right? Um, so, and then when we talk about behavior in, uh, in ABA, it's not just like behaviors are a, a bad thing. If we're just talking about those things that are observable and measurable. Um, so thinking about like, you know, uh, my child was frustrated, so he threw the remote. Okay, so the reason we don't use that language is because it's kind of subjective, right? So what might be, what I might consider um, what looks like frustration might be different for somebody else, right? Um, so we want to look at those things that tell you why they're frustrated, right? So he try to turn on the TV, it wouldn't turn on, he grabbed the remote and threw it across the room, right? Uh, so those things are observable and measurable. We can see it and we can count it once we're looking at the taking data. Um, and so, so we wanna focus on those things that we can see, uh, hear, and feel. Um, it is important to state whether uh, we see, like when we're describing behaviors, what we see and what, uh, what they look like. So we don't wanna misinterpret what uh, what is happening. We have to be careful with not to make inferences about how someone feels or why they're engaging in a specific behavior. Um, so, you know, what we call circular reasoning, he cried because he was sad or he, he was sad, so he cried. But um, one of the other reasons why we want to define behavior as best as possible is if say that we're all looking at a specific behavior, say that we're collecting data on a behavior to see, you know, um, why it's happening, what's going on. If I'm not defining it, um, then you might look for something else, right? Especially when we're working in ABA or even with parents, right? Um, you know, one parent might see one thing, one parent might see a different thing, or we're focused on different things. So, you know, for one parent, um, you know, the the aggression is screaming and hitting, where for another one, it might just be the hitting, right? So we want to make sure that we're all on the same page so that we know what we're targeting and how we're going to address it. Um, so once we identify what uh, behaviors are, again, something that's observable and measurable, um, then we want to know why they're happening, right? So we want to look at the functions of behavior. Um, once we find out the, the function of the behavior, then this gives us a little more information on how we can address these behaviors. So I don't want to uh, 
to guess, right? So say that you have your car and the check engine light comes on and you take it to the mechanic and he's like, I think it's this. So I'm going to just work on your car. Then they do it and then you get it back and it's still not fixed. And now you have, you know, a bigger problem, right? So what do you um, mechanics do? They go through, uh, they diagnose your car, right? They have that little thing that they plug into your car and then it said, hey, you know, the car is, you know, messing up here and here and this is what we have to fix. Or if it's something that they can observe too, right? Like, oh, you have a flat tire. So <laughs> that's why your car is not going, right? So, um, so that's essentially what we're doing too. So we want to figure out the function of the behavior. So we do have um, these four functions that we really look into. So we have sensory input, escape and avoidance, attention, and access to tangibles. Um, so we use the acronym SEAT, so it makes it easier to remember those, um, you know, what the, the functions are. Uh, and if you get, you know, pretty good at identifying them, it's easier to identify sometimes in the moment, where, you know, and when we're working with a child that engages in aggression, sometimes we have to try to identify why it's happening in the moment so we know how to address it. Um, so we have sensory input, so it's automatic, re uh, automatic reinforcement, so doing the behavior itself is reinforcing, so we see this behavior happen across all conditions, whether the person is alone or getting attention or playing, so no matter if, you know, say that um, we have a child that likes to uh, hand flap, right, they're doing the hand flapping when you're around, when you're not around, uh, when they're playing with their preferred activities, it's just they're trying, they're seeking some type of sensory input. Um, and we can see some aggression in these, in these behaviors, but it, that's why, again, it's uh, important to understand why these behaviors are happening and try to identify the functions, right? So if it's sensory, so what this might look like, we have the, uh, you know, we call the ABCs. So it's antecedent behavior and consequence. When we hear consequence, a lot of people think it's like something negative, it's not. It's just what happens after the behavior, right? So just to break them down, antecedent is the trigger, whatever starts the behavior. Then we have the behavior, which we learned earlier, right? That it's something that's observable and measurable. And then we have the consequence, which is what happens after, typically something that maintains the behavior. Um, so then, so for example, an example of, uh, of a sensory, like some aggression with sensory, you know, you have a child that is alone, right? They're doing their own thing. They're playing with their toys. And then... They kind of just stand up, walk over to a person or to an object, and then they bang their head against that person or a surface of like of an object. And then they just go right back to playing whatever that was. So that tells me it's sensory because they weren't really see seeking anything. They, in this example, they, they were alone. Like it didn't appear that anything was uh, making them upset, right? Like it wasn't like they were not struggling with the toy. They kind of just got up, went to the person, Bang them their head against them. It could have been once or twice. And again, that's why when we're defining behaviors, we have to see what we're looking at. Um, and then they just went back to playing with their toy. Uh, I have a kid that I have worked with and that, you know, sometimes he will just walk right by me and pinch the inside of my arm and it hurts so much. But at the same time, like I ignore it because he's, you know, he's just happened to be walking by me, my arm happened to be there, he pinched it and did not even look at me and just kept doing, going about his business. So he wasn't trying to get a reaction, from me, right? So he had like some sensory things going on. Um, then we have escape. So this is typically where we start seeing some more of uh, the aggressive behaviors. Um, so escape is when they're trying to escape or avoid uh, an activity, right? Um, so just an example, so you tell your child to clean up, then the child hits their dad, and then dad says, go to the room. Guess what just happened? They hit their dad because they're mad, and they got out of cleaning up the room, right? <laughs> so, because, I mean, cleaning up the toys, because they were told to go to the room, so we're probably going to keep doing that. Um, or another one, a child that may not like being tickled, You're tickling a child, um, hits the person and the person stops tickling. That's what's gonna happen next time. They're gonna probably do that again. Um, so, but they're trying to escape that, that uh, engagement, right? So in the first one, they're trying to escape the cleaning up. In the second one, they're trying to escape the, the tickling. They don't wanna be tickled. Okay. Any questions? And usually we see this when that, like in, uh, a demand is placed that's non-preferred or something that's subversive, right? 
So for example, going back to potty training, say, okay, it's time for potty. Kid starts hitting, throwing things. Um, and then you're like, oh, okay, we don't need to go right now. We'll go later. Well, guess what happens? Kid has an accident and then you just, it's, yeah, then it's a pill from there for you. But then at the same time, it's, they learn that, hey, you know, whenever I don't want to go to the bathroom because I don't like transitions or I'm trying to, or I'm trying to escape going to the bathroom, I'm going to do this again. Next is we have attention. So this behavior happens to get attention from someone. So this one is the one that, so for example, like I said earlier with my kid that it was sensory, when he pinched me, it's because he wasn't even looking at me. He wasn't trying to get any type of reaction from me. He just went and did it, right? With attention, our kids are engaging or our individuals are engaging in this behavior because they want to get attention from us. So for example, a child is playing alone, throws the item at the sister, and then the sister goes and plays with them. You know, so like, so that's the way of getting the sister's attention. So the sister's like, oh, you throw this? Okay, I'm gonna come play with you. And then the kid's happy, right? So they threw the object to get that sister's attention. And then this one, some of you guys might be able to relate. Uh, you and someone else are talking. Um, uh, I know I, I've had this happen to me plenty of times. Um, child hits an individual and then we turn around and say something. So whether it's like, stop hitting me or hey, what do you want, right? We're teaching them that when they hit us, that we're going to give them that attention that they want. And then we have tangibles or access to tangibles. So this behavior happens to get an item or activity, which is also another one where we see a lot of, um, you know, uh, aggressive behaviors. So with this one is, you know, say um, your child wants, you know, an ice cream. And so, because it's summer and it's hot, right? So, um, and you're not giving it to them because you're using it for potty training so they could be successful at potty training, right? So then with this, you know, they want the ice cream, they go and hit you because they want the ice cream, right? And then say, it's like, okay, I know I have to give this to you when you have a success, but I don't want you hitting me. So here's the ice cream, right? So they hit you because they know that when they hit you, that they're gonna get that ice cream or that thing that they want. So they're gonna keep doing that. Does that make sense? Any questions? Um, let's see. And, then, and this is uh, kind of a funny little meme, right? Uh, so it's all fun and game until somebody figures out the function of your behavior. So, you know, once we start, and this is why we fun, uh, focus so much on functions of behavior is because we want to know how to react, right? So like, if, you know, every time that you want something and you aggress towards us and then you get it, guess what? The child's going to keep doing that. So uh, once we learn why they're doing it and we start reinforcing that behavior, then it's no longer fun for our kids. All right. So what do we do to, uh, to work with this, right? It's we start teaching replacement behaviors. So we don't, you know, so... Um, you know, we want to focus on um, teaching replacement behaviors because it's not that we want to, well, we do want to decrease the problem behaviors, but we want to still have our children get those uh, needs met, right? Um, so, you know, we can use it for learning opportunities um, and then teach them different ways to get access to what they want, right? Um, so the sensory one might be a little more difficult um because sometimes we can't find something that matches that input but say for the pinching um say we give our kid access to you know those stress balls that are like i think it's like a balloon it might be the same texture so they might be able to start pinching that instead because i would prefer that you break that balloon than break my skin so you know trying to find ways to get creative and and uh or teach those replacement behaviors but Anyways, replacement behaviors are things that we want to see our children engage in instead of behaviors that were that, you know, the maladaptive behaviors. Um, so usually we teach this through functional communication. So using their words, PECS. So PECS is picture exchange communication. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but it's pretty much, um, you know, now, now that we have technology, it's, you know, we have uh, augmentative devices, I can never say that word, but you know, it's essentially they're exchanging a picture for the thing that they want. 
So say the child wants an ice cream, they have a picture of an ice cream, they give it to you. This is for, say, for a non-verbal kid. Um, or we want to teach them to point, ask, you know, different ways to get what they want in the moment. Uh, so what if your child wants something that's not available right then? Um, if it's for access to an item, give for like a choice between what is available. So say that your child wants an ice cream, right? We know that they can't have ice cream because we're using that for a party, right? So it's not available right now. So, you know, we don't have ice cream or we can only get ice cream when you go potty, but you can have this or this instead. Maybe something kind of equivalent. Um, so, oh, we don't have ice cream, but you can have a cookie or you can have a piece of chocolate, right? If it's to escape or doing a task that they need to do, so um, offer a choice, uh, you know, like, uh, like in the sense of how, how do you want to do the order, right? So if it's getting ready for bed, so they don't want to brush their teeth. So what do you want to do? Do you want to do story time first or do you want to uh, put your pajamas on, right? So again, we just want to give our children the option to use their communication to communicate what they want and give alternatives. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, it's, you know, when mean what you say. So if you tell your child to do something, always follow through. Um, so don't let them escape again, if that's the, the function of the behavior. Um, and if you realize that it's too late or, you know, or it's something they, they can't do in the moment, you can modify those things. So say that, um, with homework, right, where they have to do, read 10 pages. Maybe you can't read 10 pages right there. Let's do two, you know, we can modify these things. Um, so Back to the behaviors you were thinking about, how well, behaviors can be re reinforced in these instances. Uh, we may have to start small and work up to the final desired response. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Like, so we're breaking down the homework, right? So your child is trying to escape homework. Break it down. You don't have to do, you know, read 10 chapters all at once. I don't, you know, most of us don't. So maybe do a page here or two here and there, uh, but re provide reinforcement at the end or say that it's a math problem. You know, you do, instead of doing all 10 at once, do two, get reinforcement, get a break, then you do uh, more. Um, so yeah, so shortening the amount of tasks um, and then slowly increase. So say that um, with homework, you know, usually you can get your, your child to do one math problem. So you work on that one at a time, you work on that. And then as they're successful with that, then you do two, then you go up to three and so on and so forth. And you kind of build up towards that. And that's even things with like, um, you know, using, you know, uh, brushing their teeth and following a nighttime routine for things that they do not like or want to do. Um, so thinking of the big picture, sometimes we get into the habit of trying to correct or intervene with every behavior that we uh, don't want to see. So before you react to a behavior, consider the following. Is the behavior harmful to your child or anyone else? Is the behavior disruptive to anyone else around or is it age appropriate? So thinking about like um, some behaviors, right? So we don't wanna ignore everything, but when we're thinking about aggression, if it's something, say that, you know, that kid that pinches me just walks by and just like taps my arm. I'm not gonna pay attention to that because they're just tapping my arm, right? As opposed to like pinching me or, you know, they're trying to escape and they hit me. I'd rather have them say no. So, um, you know, some of these behaviors that we um, we can, you know, say that we can't teach some, you know, in the moment, then we just kind of ignore it. Pick your battles. And then the other part is, so we were talking about earlier, we were talking about the, replacement behaviors, right? So going a little bit more in depth with the replacement behaviors, you always wanna find something that's going to replace the behavior that, that that's happening, right? So if it's access to that ice cream, right? Um, asking for the ice cream nicely. Again, we still want, that's why we're like, okay, you can't have it because you're gonna need to go to the bathroom, but give them some other choices. But say that then later on they ask for, you know, mom can I watch five minutes of the, on the iPad? Sure, you know, I'd rather have them ask in a nice way, uh, in an appropriate way, than engage in those maladaptive behaviors um, or escaping, you know, escaping a task, right? So 
instead of, you know, I don't want to do math, I'm going to throw myself on the ground, I'm engaging these maladaptive behaviors or in this aggression or I'm going to throw stuff at you, I would rather have um, the kid say, can I, can I do this later? Or can I do it in five minutes? Or can I do this instead? Um, so finding different ways to reinforce those behaviors because those are the behaviors we want to see instead of the aggression. And the other thing too is we want to catch them being good, right? So we're talking about um, you know reinforcing behaviors. So whenever they use these replacement behaviors, as often as you can, try to reinforce it, right? So say that you know every time they want a cookie you give them a cookie, but don't give them a full cookie. You can break it down, right? Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> Marianne, I saw your eyebrows go up. So no, we're not going to give them a cookie every time. <laughs> so, you know, we can break that cookie down, right? And then again, this is just during, during like the, uh, the teaching process. So during the teaching process, you want to reinforce as much as you can so that they understand this is what, this is what needs to be done for me to get what I want. Um, and then after that, then we can start breaking that down, right? Well, you can't have a cookie right now, but you can have it in five minutes, or you can't have a cookie right now, but you can have, I don't know, a raisin. You know, maybe they like raisins, who knows? Uh, but, you know, just find something else that they can have instead of that cookie. But again, at the beginning, we want us to reinforce as much of that be behavior as we can within reason, right? Um, if a child comes up to me and says, oh, pretty, pretty, please, Mr. Carlos, can I have a knife? That's a big fat no. I'm not gonna give you a knife. I don't care how nice you ask, you're not getting it, you know? So just, um, but, but yes, within reason, we wanna reinforce those behaviors that we do wanna see. Um, other things is like looking at positive opposites. So refrain from what you don't want to see, uh, refrain what you don't want to see into what you do want to see. So, um, so instead of saying stop running or stop hitting, we can say, you know, walk please, or um, I like the way you keep your hands to yourself or keep your hands to yourself, something like that. But we want to do something a little more positive. So we're not uh, doing the whole, don't do this, no. Because um, I don't know if, you know, I mean, I'm sure you guys have been all around kids, right? The more we tell them no, the more that they're going to do it. But they also get a reaction from us. So uh, we have a couple of examples. So John is throwing blocks when cleaning up. And so instead of saying, don't throw the blocks, it's like, hey, say, say he's still throwing them, but he's still cleaning up. We'll say, hey, I like the way that you're cleaning up, but let's do it this way, you know, and then just kind of show them how to do it. Um, so again, with when we're talking about aggression, right? Say that they're engaging in, a, in hitting because they want your attention. Instead of like, hey, don't hit me. Um, you can say, hey, I like the way you got my attention, but let's try it this way. And maybe guide their hand to tap you on the shoulder or on the arm. Um, or even say, if, it, if it's verbal, you say, or you can just say, hey, mom, and then reinforce that behavior. Okay. Um, so um, just, you know, some things we, we let them slide, but other things we want to focus on. But again, it, for each family, it depends on what the behavior that you're looking at, right? Again, um, every child is different. The functions of the behaviors are going to be different for everybody. So in the ways that we approach things are going to be different. Um, but just really identifying, you know, first the function, like, why is this happening? And then from there going on to, okay, how can I make this, uh, how can I change this behavior, okay? So just really kind of breaking those things down. And again, you can get that help from, you know, if you have ABA services, you know, talk to, you um, your BCBA, you know, they might be able to help come up with some solutions. And I'll tell you right now, it's not always like, you know, our first recommendation isn't always the correct one. You know, we got to try, try, what is it? Um, we got trial and error. Couldn't come up with it. But, you know, so we, you know, and sometimes a function can have multiple, uh, a behavior can have multiple functions. So it's just really uh, working with the team on identifying how we're going to address these behaviors, how we're going to reduce the ones that we don't want to see and increase the ones that we want to see. But then going back to when we're talking about describing and defining behaviors, that's why it's also important that we're all on the same page so that we know what we're addressing. Sorry, um, any questions? All good. I'm not shy. Okay, I have a question. Well, yeah. I know I've done this in the past, like a long, long time ago, but for the new people, um, and I know this is really 
could vary, which is probably what you're going to tell me. But um, I remember when we were trying to do certain behaviors that we were trying to get rid of, and we had like this big, you know, it spikes that behavior just goes from, eh, and then it, you know, you get that really big, you know, it goes up and then finally it goes, you know, hopefully it goes back down again, but yeah. typically to kind of give people some hope about how long does like maybe uh, the pinching one go away. As long as you can figure out how to replace whatever they're needing, meeting that sensory need, how long can parents expect to to have to, to modify their behavior in order to not be, yeah. you know, pinching brother, sister, aunt, uncle, kids in their classroom, you know, where it can get, where now you're, you know, obviously you're injuring people outside of your own home where you know you could you could get in trouble or you know you could get called to the principals and all that other stuff but I guess basically yeah how how do you they deal with you know that working up to that for extinguish burst and then and survive that period <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I, that. Yeah, yeah can I jump in on that one um maladaptive behavior is like just one of the, like my favorite parts of ABA and working through it you know the hard part is that we can't predict what that timeline will look like there's also a lot of assumptions we're going to make. We're going to assume we did identify the function correctly at the assessment um, and that we have found an equivalent replacement behavior that meets the needs for that child. And then the other piece is making sure we have adherence from everybody that is working with that child to implement that replacement behavior and is consistent. Okay. So that may include like the ABA team, it may include parents, it may include grandparents, teachers, when you kind of multiply that across all individuals in all settings. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big piece of it also. And, and then also looking into like the reinforcement history. So how long has this individual been reinforced by this behavior? Mm -hmm. um, that will tell us a lot. So if we have uh, maybe like an, an, an older teenager who's been engaged in behavior for many years and has a very long history of reinforcement. It's going to be much more challenging to extinguish that behavior and teacher replacement because it's ingrained and it's been just so heavily reinforced. Um, so there's a lot of factors there, but we, you mentioned the extinction burst and I thought something really important to remember um, when we are working on uh, extinguishing a behavior, teacher replacement, we do sometimes and quite often see a initial um, rise and peak in the behavior. So we say it's worse before it gets better. And my example is always with your, you know, use the door, you turn the doorknob, every time you turn it, it opens and you get to leave. Mm -hmm. If there's a time when your doorknob breaks and you try to get out and you try to turn it, you expect that you'll be able to get out and you can't. And what is our initial reaction? We like jiggle it, we shake it, we bang it, and then we escalate because that doorknob should turn and let me out. And today it's not working. And um, at some point though, you you learn that this is not effective and you're going to find an alternate way to leave the room. Maybe it's like crawling out of a window <laughs> and getting someone to fix the door. Um, but that's really like when we look at behavior that, that yeah, the extinction burst can be, can be challenging to work through. Um, for some individuals, it can be one session. One day it's a peak and, um, and then it decreases from there. Um, with ABA, we do track and we, we, um, we use visual graphing of all, all of the behaviors that were uh, looking at. And so we can track it. And I could say like today I had a hundred aggressive behaviors, but that's my peak. And tomorrow it's only 10. And then from there, I can continue to graph it and see it decreasing. And that tells us also that we're on the right track and that what we're doing is effective. So I guess for parents, then I, this, I guess the key would be to track behaviors, right? I mean, you just would start a log and whatever that behavior mm -hmm. is, you marked, you know, today, this is what happened. And then time and then try to obviously to help if you do have an AB uh, an ABA helping you um I'm sorry a BCBA helping you um then obviously that gives them a lot more to go off of rather than if they're coming in totally blind because hopefully you're doing some of that prep work like you said that baseline work where okay this is that behavior this is what I've been seeing and then hopefully we can address the behavior and like you said find something to replace it so that they're still meeting their need, whatever that need may be. Exactly. And, and we always say that a behavior occurs because it does serve a purpose and there's, there's a need there. So we don't want to take that need away and say, well, you're just going to stop hitting. Mm -hmm. It serves a purpose and a need, and we want to find a more appropriate alternative mm -hmm. for that behavior. 
Uh, and so it's it, sometimes it's harder. That's why we, it's sometimes nice to have a team working with you because it's hard to evaluate your own behavior. And it's, you know, we don't always notice the things that we do. Mm-hmm. I might give it attention that I don't realize I'm giving, but when someone draws my attention to it and says, no, you're making eye contact and you're making comments. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're, you're right. Yep. I am. <laughs> and that's really helpful to have even just a third party to give you some feedback about what's happening. Um, and it's just hard to see it when it's, when you're, when you're in it, um, it can be very stressful. It can be very intense and emotions can take over. So it is helpful to have just a third party that's neutral to give you feedback. Um, but the biggest takeaway is what can I teach that individual to do instead of engaging in this behavior? And we want it to be a behavior that's easy to engage in. So if with the example of like the pinching, if we want them to, um, uh, squeeze that, that stress ball. We want it to be accessible, available, easy to access and use. If I have to go through a lot of effort to go and get it and find it and it's in a closet or I will you know, have to ask for it repeatedly, it's not going to be an easy alternative for me. I'm just going to go back to pinching Mr. Carlos's arm. <laughs> so I guess then one step further, what, what do parents do? I remember seeing this question really recently when they have an older child who who is autistic and then they also have a younger child who's either not talking yet maybe just one or two very very you know limited language and for whatever reason the parent can't identify why the autistic child keeps being super aggressive make you know very very aggressive hitting to the point where the other child's bleeding and obviously that child cannot defend themselves and you know you're caught in the middle but if the parent isn't being successful in identifying what that behavior is, or like he was perfectly fine. And then literally, you know, he was on the floor playing perfectly fine with his favorite toy. And then he just got up and, you know, attacked sister. How do you suggest they address those types of issues? Yes. And that's so tough and it does happen. Yeah. Um, the other piece that we would also look at is ABA is not necessarily the, um, the number one service. There, there might be other services that would be more appropriate. So that might be looking to mental health services. Um, if it's very intense, maybe even in a, a temporary inpatient or outpatient um, hospitalizations, things like that. But um, it would also be going back to their doctor or developmental pediatrician or other individual that they're working with to identify what would be the most appropriate service for that person. Um, and then, but it is hard. Number one, you know, goal for us is always to make sure that the that the family's safe and the child is safe and that the people within that immediate family are safe. So that would also be something to, to consider is making sure that, um, for example, like if we know that the possibility, always staying in the room with the younger one, make sure they're always safe or having, um, you know, somebody home when you can't be. Mm-hmm. I mean, but, and, and I guess I, that, I think that's the hard one for me because the, the examples that I have seen are like, literally, you know, I was, in the kitchen, Mm -hmm. like, you know, literally I can look where they're at and it just happens in seconds. I mean, that's just how it is. Kids are fast. Um, but I just feel like it's just such a hard one because yes, you know, one can't express themselves. The other one, you know, is too little, but, uh, I, you know, I don't like seeing those pictures of kids hurt and, you know, they really don't understand why it's happening. And I feel like sometimes, I don't know. I just, that one's a hard one for me. And I was just hoping you'd had some input. Thanks. Uh, it, is, it is a hard, a hard situation. Um, thankfully, not as, we don't see it as commonly with, um, with the referrals that we get in. It's, it's just, uh, but it is hard to see. Sometimes those functions are very unclear. Mm-hmm. They, they're there and they exist, but it's unclear. It could mm-hmm. be something as simple as a, you know, a sound of the, toddler made that irritated them and then they mm-hmm. engage in that behavior it could be um other other you know factors so how would you suggest people I guess address that so when we'll say you know your autistic child has an issue with we'll say tv volume mm-hmm. so you know I like I'll say well child that's autistic doesn't want wants it super super low well you have another child who's watching the tv they're the ones that are watching their program at a higher level well then you know, your other child gets upset because that's happening. They don't want to leave the room. And I think it's very hard for parents to try to meet the needs of all the children and and the parent and parents as well, right? I'm I have my needs too. I don't like TV blasting at full volume 
and you know where I can't even hold a conversation with somebody in the room. So how would you go about trying to address that uh, and trying to fulfill that need? I mean, would the option then be to say, hey, to child, okay, you need to wear headphones when you watch the TV, when you're watching your preferred program. Well, then, and I don't know, I mean, this to me, it's just like, I go down this little rabbit hole. Okay, well, then what if the child, you know, after a while it gets annoying wearing headphones and, you know, I want to just enjoy my show and, you know, be able to do that. So how do you help people negotiate that and try yeah. to make, I guess, people as happy as they can be in the household? It's tough. And I, so I'm going to use example. I have three kids and I, and I know genuinely I cannot make all of them happy at the same time. And it's hard to accept. I do have a, a, one with special needs as well. Um, and so it is hard to balance out everyone's needs. And I also ironically have one that's hypersensitive to sound and one who could tune out everything. Uh, but I use a lot of, uh, I use a lot of the strategies with an ABA at home, I use those, you know, visuals. I use a lot of the first then examples, like first we're going to do this, then this, um, or even just priming, like we're, this person's going to go first, they get to pick what they want, or this person's going to go first and they get to have it loud. You can leave the room while they're watching it, or you can stay and wear the headphones. So at least there's a choice there. Um, but allowing each one to have, you know, somewhat fair and equal access to like a volume that they want. So he's going to listen to it loud. You can leave or stay with headphones, but then when it's your turn, you can turn it down and you can pick the show you want to watch. Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's hard no matter what, right? I mean, even if you're not autistic, sometimes, you know, your preferences yeah. don't, I, I mean, some like for me, I feel like sometimes I'm a short order cook because everybody <laughs> likes to eat every, you know, different That's things. Cool. But again, you know, it's kind of, I guess, have to make it work as best you can. And then hopefully once they get older, they learn how to cook and they can cook their own meals. You can not have to be the chef anymore. <laughs> but, yeah. And yeah. another thing too is just kind of even teaching um, the kids how to interact with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of tolerating being, you know, Vanessa was mentioning earlier, but like kind of tolerating being in the same room, playing the same activities or, you know, playing different activities, but being in the same room. So, um, you know, using, you know, different uh, services and providers and stuff, you can definitely, um, depending on what the function of the behavior is, right? Um, it's just looking to see how we can incorporate the siblings into um, the other child's um, everyday life, you know, mm -hmm. or every day. Yeah, and I also want to add, going back to the, the, you know, the toddler and the older child scenario, is that I'm just always so amazed by how quickly, you know, young children learn. Mm -hmm. And so for a um, a younger child, even in, a, in, as a toddler, like, it's just amazing the, the things that you can teach them. And so there might be um, like skills or, or replacements you can also teach the younger child to use if you're noticing patterns of behavior. So for example, when I, um, you know, when they drop a toy and it's too loud, that the other child will gain, engage in a behavior. Um, you can also give them different things to use, or, or it could even just be teaching them to you know, stay with an eyesight um, mm -hmm. until they're safe. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I've seen so many questions. <laughs> um, I, but my kids, my child's a little bit older. We're already in our late teens. So obviously I've kind of, you know, heard all the questions, but um, I guess if Michael or Jessica doesn't have any, um, I will let you go because I know you had another commitment, but I really appreciate your time and all the valuable information that you've shared. I think it's very helpful to parents um, especially when they're starting this journey, because it's very, very overwhelming. Um, you know, you're trying to do your best by your child and, you know, you might be at a total loss because it's totally new to you. And, and, you know, we're just trying to do our, everybody's just trying to do their best. And sometimes you need extra help. So I appreciate That's your so help. Good. And I appreciate that you guys are here and in the Valley and, you know, can, can spread the word and